You want to hear a really sad story? I just did like an hour and a half, two hours of video and didn't have, uh, had not pushed play. Uh, I did look a couple times over at the monitor and think, what does it look like when I press play? Oh, I'm sure it's fine. Anyway, here we go again. All right, so uh, I've already done this, but I'm going to tell you about it. Where I left you last time was on this primary analytical tool, all right, uh, for the institutionalists. And if you're an institutionalist economist, how do you go about studying a society? Well, you're kind of looking for the rules of the game. Uh, now, I'm getting a little unclear here about when I've brought stuff up on which video, so I hope I hadn't already said this. But one of my professors at Tennessee that was an institutionalist told a story in class. He said, hey, let's say you walk in on a room and you see four people playing cards. What would be more useful to you in interpreting the events, uh, knowing why they were there, their motivations, uh, one of them wants to win a lot of money, one of them wants to get away from the house, one of them wants the camaraderie, or knowing the rules of the game. Or they're playing draw poker, right? Which one will be more useful? I mean, and, and clearly the rules of the game are much more useful to being able to follow the action, you know, to figure out what's going on, right? Well, that's what the institutions are about. They're like, what, the, what are the rules of the game? Because they're not assuming that the rules of the game are uh, market systems, capitalism. Uh, they're not assuming uh, under Marx that we would have, you know, socialism or whatever. We don't know what system. We, we, we can't assume the way the economy in Brazil works. We have to go in and figure it out. There may be differences that we don't see superficially. We, may, we have to figure out why do people act the way they do in that society. All right? and I'll be going into some more detail on that in just a minute, uh, actually for the second time today, but the other time I didn't video it. Now, um, so, all those rules that people have fall into two categories is the argument, right? Everything you do is evaluated. Mostly you evaluate stuff internally. You don't want to look like an idiot. You want to make sure that people accept you. Remember, we are social animals. is an absolute central part of this uh, school of thought. That when you, okay, when you meet your, your um, uh, you know, significant other's parents for the first time, all right, you are very, very much making sure that you are behaving properly. No one has to make you do it. Right? That uh, you're, you're policing yourself internally. Uh, I was a new kid at school seven times. So as a consequence, not the same school, that would have been kind of weird. Like, oh, it's, it's, who is that kid? I don't know who that is. What's well, me, you idiot. I was here yesterday. Um, the, uh, instead, it was seven different schools. And man, oh man, are you really sensitive to how you behave, right? So everything, you, sometimes it is uh, evaluated externally, all right? We may put you in prison. We may ostracize you, whatever. But most of it's internal because we want to be a member of the pack. Now, some of the values that we have are simply based on tradition and are culturally relative. But there's no particular logical foundation to them. Uh, the uh, fashion is an obvious example. We can see in our own lifetimes how fashions change, and we know that there was no logical reason for it. And we know that we could not have predicted it using science, what the next you know, fashion trend is going to be. But we're also very careful to make sure we follow those trends, interestingly enough. Now, a lot of these, these cultural behavior, I'm sorry, ceremonial behaviors are harmless, but a lot of them are also harmful. They may create those invidious distinctions that I talked about a minute ago, uh, racism, sexism, um, and, and some things I'm going to talk about here when we get to, to the example I told you about, and uh, conspicuous consumption, which is not particularly helpful. As opposed to values that are uh, instrumental, they're based on logic and reason, they have a goal, and we're willing to change. Uh, let's say you're a farmer and you want to increase your crop yield. Okay, there's your goal. Then what is it that, how are you going to decide how to do this? Well, I'm going to try different methods. And I'm not locked in on one. It's not like, oh, I'm not going to change because that's the way my grandpappy farmed. Uh, that would be up here. Down here it's, oh, if that works better, I'll do it. That sounds great. Uh, there, so there are things that are driven by science. The current level of scientific advance determines whether or not it's a, a logical way of doing things. If you are still farming by having your you know, mule pull along one of those little farming things, um, then probably there's a better way to do it today. Right? So that would be instrumentally a bad idea. Maintaining eye contact in a culture where you don't do that is a bad idea up here. So the, so the ultimate basis for why what you did was right or wrong is very different between these two. And essentially, institutionalists believe the societies that emphasize the second one are more likely to develop. Now, having told you all that, let me go back to that little paragraph 
that was at the beginning of the chapter here. And by the way, I, if I may say, this is actually a pretty good chapter. Um, that, that of all the chapters I wrote, this is the one that I, I felt like really sort of nailed the school of thought, particularly because this is a really hard one to understand. All right? so, so, I, so be sure you read the chapter. Now, here's that quote I gave you earlier. And now it'll make some sense to you. The institutional structure of any society incorporates two systems of value, the ceremonial and the instrumental, each of which has its own logic and method of validation. There's the logic for this one, there's the logic for that one. While these two value systems are inherently incompatible, they are intertwined within the institutional structure through a complex set of relationships. So even though these are really distinct, they're wrapped together so tight it's sometimes it's really hard to tell one from the other. Now, uh, now let's see, what have I got next here on the slide? Again, I'm really screwed up here because I've already done this once. Uh, and, uh, okay, I'm looking. There's a red light, a red dot on my monitor. Pretty sure that means that the, it is actually videoing this time. All right. Uh, so what I want to do now is give you an example. Because as I said, this is a really hard school of thought to understand. And you need to see, you know, a specific example in order to figure out uh, exactly how it works. Now, this one here is from a paper by a guy named Dilmus James. And he, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm texting while I'm lecturing because I, I want to ask Melanie if she can do something with the dog. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Melanie. Oh, all right. Can you quiet? Oh, now he's quiet. Dog, please. No, I, I wrote dig, please. Uh, dog, please. And I actually didn't write can. Can you? Uh, okay. Uh, oh, now I wrote can you quiet Dodd, please. Uh, dog. There. Okay, I'll save that right there in case you need to send it. All right. Uh, so he was an institutionalist. Uh, look, he's a Texan. Oh, and I didn't mention this. Um, the, a, Texas was a particularly strong institutionalist state. Uh, a lot of institutional economists in Texas and, and University, of, University of Texas and University of Oklahoma. Um, now, uh, not El Paso necessarily. It was more UT Austin. Uh, but um, Dilmus James, really nice man. He's passed away now. Uh, he was friends with one of Dr. Sawyer's uh, friends. Uh, they both taught at University of Texas. Dr. Sawyer's uh, um, friend, uh, Richard Sprinkle, who is now retired from academia, but um, a longtime friend. So, anyway, Dilmus James writes this article on uh, the last 20 or 30 years in Latin America. And the question is, hey, there's been more money and focus on technology in Latin America. Why hasn't there been more development over this time period? And he's going to come at it from a very institutionalist perspective. Now, first thing I want to talk about is uh, education. And the way I usually do this in class is to kind of do a poll, but uh, I'll have to just kind of describe it here. Think about this. Let's say that your country, you have a choice between focusing primarily on primary education, like say first through eighth grade, or on college education, all right? That those are your two choices. Uh, if you're a developing economy, where would you want to focus more? Would you want to focus more on the first through eighth or on the college level? And it turns out that developing economies typically do the opposite. And that's what we're going to talk about here with Latin America as well. Well, if you're Jamaica, if you're uh, uh, Mexico, if you're um, you know, Zimbabwe, you want a basic base level of education for your population. You want to really make sure that you're focusing on primary level education. Uh, and college stuff, that's great, you know, but, but really, we just need to catch up. We just need to make sure that everyone has a basic level of education, and yet they do the opposite. They tend to focus more on college level than they do, not, not, not more in total dollar-wise, but more relative to what we do in the United States, all right? which it should be the opposite. Uh, they should be focusing more on the primary level to, in order to get, a, 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 as I say, a base level of education for everybody. Why would this happen? Why would they focus on the uh, college level? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. Then research. Okay, there's kinds of research you can do, basic research, where you're just like, it's just, it's curiosity driven. Hey, I wonder what would happen if we accelerated the proton into a beer can. Yeah, uh, now let's try a light beer, you know. Uh, just to dis discover underlying, as it says here, increased understanding of fundamental principles does not have immediate commercial objectives. Applied research is where you take knowledge developed over here and apply it to a problem in the real world, all right? Uh, now. Again, thinking developed versus developing. 
where would you want your developing economy to focus when solving problems? They get a lot of problems. Let them do the basic research in Germany, in France, the United States, and Japan. And then we'll read their journals and we'll fix these myriad problems we have in our country. And yet, again, it's the opposite. I don't want to say they spend more dollars on this than this, but the ratio of spending is higher on this than it is in the United States. Why would that happen? Uh, so again, uh, Dilmus James is trying to figure out what are the rules of the game? Why are these outcomes being created? We'll get a breakdown and figure out who's making the decisions and who's benefiting from these decisions. Here's another thing before I get into the uh, details of what the problems are. That the, your best and brightest in your country, do you want them to be attracted to managing these scientific projects or running the scientific projects? Managers or scientists? Well, the basic idea is that given that you have all these problems, you want scientists. You want people to think that, uh, in, you know, as you're growing up in this developing economy, um, man, I hope one day I can be one of the people that figures out and solves the problems that we've got, as opposed to, I want to be the one who writes the checks for the people who are doing the, the research down here. You would want this to be the most attractive. It's not. This is much more attractive in most developing economies, in no small part because you end up getting to take some of the money for yourself. You skim some off the top for yourself, all right? But that's, that's an, uh, an important issue, but not one we're going to go into much here. Uh, but no, the, the scientist part, that's not big money. This is big money, all right? And they were saying that's a problem too. Why would this happen? In addition, they tend to only fund these projects to run for a few years. They really didn't put enough money in to actually you know, carry out any decent amount of research. We got duplication of effort. We've got, we've got universities in Latin America buying expensive scientific equipment that they don't need, and then a neighboring university doing the same thing. Now they have a second one. They didn't need one. And there's a tendency to focus on things that are trendy rather than things that are related to the specific problems you have in your country. Why would this be? Well, the argument is that, and I don't think I want to go to the next slide yet, but let me look. Oh, okay, I do. Uh, that, uh, what would they say about this? Uh, what do you think is dominating in this culture? Ceremonial values or instrumental values? Are people engaging in conspicuous consumption and invidious distinction? Or are they trying to solve problems? And the argument that Dilmus James is making is, it's conspicuous consumption. And uh, that, you know, you're buying expensive scientific equipment to, to have expensive scientific equipment. Not to use expensive scientific equipment, but to have it. And that's why the neighboring institution also buys one. That's why you never budgeted enough money to actually run it. You just wanted it to be able to say that you've got it. Conspicuous consumption. And who's engaging in this cons conspicuous consumption? The poor people? The peasants? The people who are the majority of the population? No. It's the, the elites. The rich people. All right? That's also why the elites... Well, this is also conspicuous consumption here. This is like, oh, hey, accelerating protons, that's pretty cool. Uh, you get a lot more pats on the back for this sort of thing than you do for this. And why do we focus on higher education uh, instead of, of a primary? Because the rich kids are going to private school for primary. That's not their problem. But now you have this wonderful state school I can go to for college. Fantastic. So that the elites are basically solving their problems problems, which of course are problems of looking elite. Uh, they are wanting to copy the behavior of elites in other societies. Hey, look, we're just like Harvard. We've got one of these. Now, where did this come from? Okay, we're going to pick on Mexico in particular here, but of course we can pick on any one of the Americas, north or south here, even one of the countries to find the same issues. But uh, Mexico doesn't collect data on race, as I understand it, because they claim not to have a problem with race. And so, therefore, why would we bother? Well, there's a, 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 and this is one of our own professors here at TCU. I didn't realize that when I was first looking for the information for this. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm looking for, for background data on economics of race in Mexico. And Max Krukmal, I was like, oh, my God, he teaches at TCU. Uh, I didn't know him when I, when I put this together, but I know who he is now. So anyway, goes through here and talks about uh, the fact that, that um, skin color is a big deal in Mexico. All right? Now, they don't collect data on it, but... There are studies that are done on this because they have created data for it. And there's a particular study that, that, that is, uh, this is where this is from, there's a particular study that, that comes out of Vanderbilt where they have gone and sent people into Mexico and other Latin American countries 
uh, and created the data on race that they didn't have already so that they could figure out is there an impact on, of skin color and, and let me back up here and say what the real problem is the uh, well let me see what I got here first okay as races, yes, it exists, but not, okay. Our study, this says here that among the nations surveyed in the Americas, Mexico ranks fourth in terms of negative impact of skin tone on an individual's wealth behind Bolivia, Uruguay, and Ecuador, which were the, were the top three where uh, racial issues had the biggest impact on wealth and edu education. Now, why skin color? What's going on there? Uh, and I, I guess I wish this was in class for, for many reasons, but I like to ask this question because people, because students always figure it out. But let me ask you this, that, okay, in Mexico, in the rest of Latin America, who do you think's in charge? People of Spanish and Portuguese descent or people of Inca, Incan, uh, Aztec, Mayan descent? And that's right, it's people of Spanish and Portuguese descent. It's the European descendants that are still in power and that have a lighter skin color than the indigenous people. And so, as a consequence, we find here that one of these studies, oh, actually, I like this one better. Um, it's easier to look at. Okay, so they, they, it's one of these Vanderbilt studies. They, they went down there and collected data on um, not only wealth, uh, this, one, this one is uh, education. How many years of education did you get? Lightest skin color, darkest skin color. Lightest skin color, their average, uh, the, sort of the range of education on average was 10.4 to 11.7 years. For very dark skinned people, it was 4 to basically 7. All right? So, very clear trend. The darker skinned you were, the less likely you were to be educated. And this was holding other variables constant. For example, like where you lived in Mexico. Because apparently, a lot of the darker skinned people tend to, which are going to be the indigenous people, uh, tend to be uh, in the south, in the mountainous region, which is very poor. But they said, yeah, but even holding that constant, they were still worse off. Right? Uh, and then here is level of wealth in Mexico right? by skin color. Lightest skin, darkest skin. So uh, up here, let's see. Well, this is percentage uh, of, of uh, th th that uh, if you were light-skinned, you were in the 66th to 76th percentile of wealth on average, all right? Uh, so relative to everyone else in Mexico. And you can see, once again, it's very simple, that the darker-skinned you are, uh, then the poorer you are. Guess who's immigrating to the United States? It's not, Mex it's not Portuguese and Spanish. It's people who are Aztec and Incan and so forth. They're the ones coming over here. Uh, they are escaping the social problems they have in their country. And so the immigration to the United States becomes a sort of safety valve for these Latin American countries that are oppressing these people. Uh, and like, oh, that's okay. They're not going to rise up and kill us. They're just going to leave and go to the United States. Uh, and so it ends up being uh, the, the, the product of the racial issues that take place, which certainly we have as well. No question whatsoever. It just so happened that we're talking about Domus James' paper, which is about Latin America. And our indigenous people uh, are probably in the worst case of all. Um, all right. So that is a specific example of the application of, I'm going to back up to this again, This right here. Trying to figure out uh, how is this society organized. And um, I, gosh, as I say, I've already done this one, so I'm having a tough time remembering what I have and haven't done. I'm pretty sure I haven't shown you this. Here's another study question. Another lecture question, I should add. It's your second to last lecture question. Here it is. 94. And, and I'll tell you why I'm bringing this up now in just a second, but let me give you the question. First, yeah, hold this as still as I can. Okay, you might want to pause and write this one down. Uh, pattern modeling is a common institutionalist research method. What does it entail? A logically consistent story that details the institutional structure of a particular socioeconomic system and thus facilitates an understanding of why people living in that system behave as they do. It is akin to the rules of the game rather than the motivations of those playing. Well, that's what Dilmus James just did, all right? He's done pattern modeling. He's gone in and said, I'm trying to create an explanation of the way this society works that then makes sense of this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, all right? So he's trying to come up with an explanation about the rules of the game in that society, and the rule of the game is that, oh, um, Dr. Sawyer told me uh, 
that, you know, his, especially is Latin America, uh, that there are nightclubs in Mexico City where one of the things the bouncer is doing is that uh, the bouncer is trying to look at your, at your facial structure to see uh, whether or not you look European or uh, indigenous. And guess who gets in and guess who doesn't get in. Well, if that's true, then certainly who's going to get a business loan, who's going to get a job, is also tremendously affected by they're looking at what you look like. All right? And as you know, we've done that here in our own culture as well, that what you look like is making a difference between, in, in terms of how uh, uh, people, what, what economic outcomes are possible for you. Let me text Melanie here uh, real quick. Mom and dad called couldn't answer. Okay, my parents just called for some reason, and uh, but I didn't want to stop the video. All right. Okay, uh, so that's this pattern modeling thing. That's an example of pattern modeling where you're trying to figure out the rules of the game in society, and there is, uh, and, and let me say this too. So, well, gosh, what can we do to help Mexico develop? Oh, you need to lower your trade barriers. You need to uh, balance your budget. Oh, my gosh, the institutions would say this has nothing to do with the real problems. This, has, this is going to have, have very little impact uh, on what's really going on in Mexico. You, know, you need to make it easier to start a business. No. You need to make it easier to be dark-skinned. All right? And how do you accomplish that? I have no freaking idea. That's why I don't do development research, because I find it horribly depressing, because I don't know how you possibly fix these things. Uh, but the underlying problems are not related to fiscal and monetary policy. They're related to the rules of the game and the uh, relative, let me back up to that, focus on ceremonial versus instrumental valuing. And these things are really deep-seated in a society and hard to change. Um, okay, that was depressing. Now, let's see. The next thing I want to show you is some examples of some institutionalist research. Uh, you will find that, it's, again, this one's really hard to understand because it is so different. And so, I, 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 for this one, I thought, well, it might be useful to have a couple of uh, examples of institutionalist research uh, to talk about. So I can say, what, what do they do? The Journal of Economic Issues is a, uh, the big institutionalist journal. And here's somebody, actually a, a guy I know, he just emailed me last week. And in fact, I just realized I have to email him back because I haven't done that yet. Um, but uh, talking about the work of Kenneth Boulding, who was a famous economist, uh, and the Earth's limited resources and capacity for regeneration. So they're, 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 uh, I don't know if that's his wife or not, uh, or his daughter. Uh, but anyway, they are trying to work on looking at this uh, issue of sustainability from an institu institutionalist perspective. I have, did not read the paper, so that's all I can tell you about it. Now, one of the common criticisms of institutionalism is, well, you all just don't understand math. That's the problem. Uh, and so you're writing all these long stories about racism and so forth because you can't figure out the complex math stuff. Well, no. I mean, they do math as well. Here's a regression analysis actually talking about income inequality. And uh, the regression here has the Gini coefficient on the far left. I'm sure some of you know what that is. Uh, that is a measure of the income uh, inequality in a country and how it's related to various factors. So they run a regression. So sure, if they think it's warranted, then they run a regression, but it's not something that they think is absolutely necessary to make it worthwhile. Here, oh, I, I put this one in here because it uh, reminds me that how much post-Keynesian and institutionalist economics get, get, they get along together, which is really weird because they're from such different foundations. But nevertheless, uh, they're very tight. And uh, look, should banks be banned from creating money? Well, we just did this on the last exam. This whole endogenous money thing from the post-Keynesians. So here somebody is talking about, not that they wouldn't talk about this even without knowing about post-Keynesianism, but uh, this is a very popular concept in post-Keynesian economics, and they are asking the question, uh, should banks be banned from creating money? All right. I don't know. Didn't read that one either. Uh, this actually is a, a, someone I went to grad school with, and she has here a... a, a uh, argument about payday lending and I conclude that an analysis of the impact of payday lending on consumers in society and offer policy recommendations which is what you want to do and then here is probably the one of the most famous articles ever written at least uh, on the fourth floor of Scarborough Hall um, underdevelopment in Jamaica an institutionalist perspective by Don R Elliott and John T Harvey and I want to read a little bit of this to you because of, uh, of how much it, it uh, fits with what we talked about so far about institutionalism. This must be from our conclusion. 
This leads directly to the third point. Jamaica, like all other developing states, does not suffer from one problem, which, when removed, will open the floodgates of wealth and prosperity. Jamaica is a complex culture comprised of particular worldviews, customs, mores, and taboos that are interwoven with a unique history. The solution to Jamaica's development problem must be concocted, that's probably Dr. Elliott's word, I wouldn't use that one, uh, she used a lot of fancy language, um, within that framework and with a watchful eye toward potential feedback effects and interdependencies. The goal is to orient economic activity toward democratic problem solving, small d, democratic, it means for the average person. But the most significant current problem is the monopoly of power held by Jamaican elites. They control economic activity, and they have no immediate incentive to do any more uh, than work to maintain the status quo. Uh, everything sucks. All right. I believe that's the end of this one. Yes, it is. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is, let me change the video here, or the, change the PowerPoint. Da, 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 da. Close. And I want this one now. And shift F5. Ah! It's on the last one. Let me back up to the first one. Because, as I've said a number of times now, I've actually already done this. <laughs> I've already been through this whole thing. All right. This is about a particular method called system dynamics modeling. And uh, let me show you again. And by the way, this is going to be the last lecture question for the entire semester. Everything else is reading. However, of course, I will naturally be lecturing on all the other stuff. But uh, you can now, as soon as I give you this answer, finish all the questions for the rest of the semester. Okay, remember the one on pattern modeling, all right? Uh, let's see, I'm trying to read it here on the monitor. Keep your hands still, John. Uh, logically consistent story that details the institutional structure, da, da, da. Now, Michael Radzicki wrote an article uh, in like 88 where he said, you know, there are some weaknesses to that whole pattern modeling thing, and here's an idea to do something different. And, what I, and this is the last study question answer, uh, lecture study question answer. Uh, so you might want to pause, and I'm going to hold it right there, pause and uh, write it down. Pattern modeling suffers from the fact that it is imprecise and complex and that it is difficult to efficiently process so much information. Radzicki recommends formalizing the process, sorry, I can't see it, the monitor's a long way away, uh, by using a computer modeling technique called system dynamics. SD highlights processes rather than, uh, than resting points, allows holistic analysis, and emphasizes the role of feedback loops. Um, and so, this is an idea that, uh, you know, somebody who is, who is sympathetic to this institutionalist approach, but he's saying, yeah, but you're making it hard on yourself by, by sort of writing a long story about racism. You know, you can model this. Actually, you can model it, and then you can really think it through in a way that uh, you couldn't have otherwise. Hey, there, I, I didn't mention this last time around. There's a, a fantastic uh, two-volume set by, a, by an institutionalist named Gunnar Myrdal that I was published in like 47, I think. Uh, and it's called An American Dilemma. He had been asked by some international group to write a book on race relations in America. And the American Dilemma, of course, being, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal unless you're black, unless you're Hispanic, unless, you know, and so on. So the American Dilemma being, in particular, at that point, uh, the... Uh, 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 black Americans versus white Americans, right? Uh, and he originally was very anti-institutionalist, interestingly enough, but he says as he wrote the book, he's like, oh my God, there's no way I can explain this without thinking about the economy being embedded um, in a, a, a larger society. Uh-oh, I can't remember if I've already covered something that I wanted to, if I need to cover something, I don't know if I did it in the previous video, I'm gonna have to stop this one and go back and look and see if I've already done this, but again, I'm all screwed up by the fact that I lectured for an hour with no, uh, uh, no recording going on, but uh, let me go check something, hang on.